Welcome to the Two Month Review, the weekly podcast from Open Letter and 3%, in which we take a single book and talk about it bit by bit over a couple of months. Um, as I'm Chad Post, and as always, I'm joined by Brian Wood. Hi, Chad. That was the weakest welcome I've ever heard. It's like, well, uh, welcome. Come on, I was, get, well, in, get in there fierce. Come on, buddy. Boom. Welcome. Hello. We're back. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Dial Two Month Review. Dial back. <laughs> and, and, and coming at us from a from apparently a furnace is uh, George Carroll, who is out in Seattle in a non-air conditioned house. And he said that he would be sweating profusely and blowing a fan right up into the microphone. So yeah. welcome, George. So I am. <laughs> and George is, um, George is stepping in for Steven Sparks, who is going to be on tonight, but he had to go to a, 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 a publisher's dinner. Um, and I don't know what publisher, but it's apparently one that's more important than open letter. Um, so you're tag teaming in for him, I guess, or literary literary tag team match. Well, this is the section that I that I actually wanted to be in, and oh, uh, you know, Sparks uh, Sparks like put his little. Uh, um, <laughs> he, <laughs> so I'm glad Sparks isn't around. You know, I'm sure that he's like you know in some like really great San Francisco restaurant with Yamazaki and and the whole gang. And, and <laughs> listen, you know, listen, listening to books yeah. that have million dollar, uh, listening to descriptions of books with million dollar advances and uh, minimal, uh -huh. minimal mm -hmm. interest. Mm -hmm. Three or four yep. first dinner. Four dinner. Yeah. Of course. Free drink. Yeah. That's how, yeah. That's, yeah. Wow. So yeah, so thanks for being here, man. How's retirement? Okay. So, so George, you've been on before, and when you were on before, you were still a sales rep. And then mm -hmm. since that time, you have officially retired. Uh, about six weeks ago, I'm still not anywhere near like a routine, but uh, I got off, I stopped just like um, about 10 days before the World Cup. So I got to watch every World Cup match. It was just great. <laughs> That's awesome. That's perfect. So now I'm taking a little bit of a breather. And then uh, what, a week from, Sat week from Friday? Yeah. Yep. We from Friday's Premier League. I'm all yep. I'm in. I'm all in. Kicks off who, right away. Who do you follow for Premier League? The Spurs. Okay, very cool. So which which So are you gonna are you gonna do the uh uh Brian, you're gonna do the uh the pre the fantasy premier league with us? Uh maybe. I have no clue about any of that, but it's a great <laughs> way for me to learn. I'll wow. I'll invite you. Okay. I'll invite you. Yeah. <laughs> if anyone out there is, is interested in being part of a, a literary uh, Premier League fantasy draft thing, um, as long, email as, long me. as I get Wayne Rooney, that's all I care about. <laughs> <laughs> you, can have, you have Wayne Rooney and Beckham. <laughs> be the first two drafts. I've, draft I've got Zlatan and Wayne Rooney. Those guys know how yeah. to score. <laughs> Word. <laughs> This is true. So I, I got to see a nice bloody picture of Wayne Rooney a couple of I saw ago. that, yeah. <laughs> oh, really? I haven't seen this yet. Yeah, I got oh, his yeah, nose yeah, broke. Broke. broke his nose. Oof. Yeah. That's, that usually has a Too lot of blood. Bad. Too bad. Yeah, I've been gone. The reason we had another week off is I was in the woods in Prince Edward Island uh, with my son, and there's no... We had no good internet service at all. <laughs> it would have been, been worse than the Irish experience. <laughs> Like much, much, much worse. It was interesting. Just uh, a few weeks ago, I was watching one of the Croatia games, and one of the guys was Croatian, and the other guy I was watching it with was Serbian. He was a Serbian Muslim, and the other one was Croatian. Um, I guess he would probably be agnostic. But it was a strange... It's like we were like trying to grill, and like uh, you had to use, like, hey, can we use th these tongs? He's like, no, just use separate tongs and it's fine. Like, we can use the same grill because, like, we're doing hot dogs and stuff. <laughs> but, no, it was, it was a trip reading this, you know, about the war and everything like that. Um, yeah, I was hanging out with a, a, Ser a Serbian and a, and a Croatian watching the Croatia game. It was fun. <laughs> that sounds like it could be a, the setup for a joke. Yeah, that does sound like a setup for a joke. I still have no clue about what happened Hey Isaac, um, in in Yugoslavia between ninety one and ninety four, but I just started watching a a nine hour documentary on it called uh, I think Death of Yugoslavia. So 
I'm, I'm, about, I'm about 30 minutes into it, so I'm starting to learn a little bit. <laughs> While that was going on, interestingly enough, and when I was in high school, our, um, I, I don't remember what the class is actually called. It was like a civics class or like That, that was my sort of blunt like segue into segue. the book, by the way. Like, yeah, so I'm gonna. Soccer. I'm picking that up. I'm picking yeah, that up. Right, hit it, me. hit it. Yeah. Um. So they. Uh. So we had a teacher in which we spent the entire semester only going over the Yugoslav War because it was when that was going on. It would have been '93. Yeah. Um. So it was that spring. So trying to contextualize everything that's happening. And at the time, I thought like I kind of get this, and it seems like a, a situation in which you can't really uh, get out of it in any clear cut way. There's no like everyone's everyone's bad. And everything, everything that's happening is bad, <laughs> and everyone's killing each other. And if they, and if they just don't decide to stop, this won't end itself. Was sort of the impression I was left with. But I used to know a lot more than I do now. Although it comes up in a lot of Dubravka's books, including this section, which, yeah. as your segue, is part three, the Devil's Garden, of which we're going to be talking about the first half of it this week and the last half, second half next week. Um, and this one gets set up with a, a quote from the movie Falling Down. Which have either of you ever seen this movie? Yes. I, for whatever reason, I loved no. this movie as a kid. <laughs> Me too. Yeah. I absolutely saw it in the theater. I think I went on a date and saw this in the theater and was like, this movie is awesome. <laughs> this guy's pissed. That's a really <laughs> weird date movie. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, it is. Have you seen it, George? No. No, I haven't. <laughs> I don't, it must be. I hadn't thought about this movie in a million years. And then it shows up here with like, the quote, hey, where do you think you're going? I'm going home, which does set up, like the, the movie is much more uh, violent. I'm and to, uh, he's in, Is he in South Central Los Angeles? Like when that was still called South Central? That's what I, that's my impression, but They'd, I don't like, remember for sure. I didn't realize you could rebrand cities, but I think they rebranded South Central and Compton because it has negative connotations or something. Like yeah. it's, called, oh, yeah. it's called Southern Los Angeles or something like, <laughs> like that now. <laughs> But it, it's a crust. It's a crusty white guy, like a you know a buttoned up like nineteen fifties looking white dude wearing a a white uh, button up shirt, short sleeve, and a, a tie. And he hates what happened to his city and where are the values. And he he takes a baseball bat and starts wreaking havoc everywhere. Yeah, it just kind of he leaves a bend his car because he's stuck in a in a traffic jam. Right. Uh, this is described. Yeah, I think so. Of this, but... Yeah. That, I know that this comes up in the second half of this section, so we'll we'll get there. But uh, I just remember what sets him off is he wants a, a McMuffin from McDonald's, and they stop serving breakfast at ten thirty, and it's like ten thirty one or something. <laughs> so, is, it, is this like the, the movie from ninety three? It's not the Michael Douglas movie. Is it? Yeah, it's the Michael yeah. Douglas movie. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Totally off my radar. No, didn't yeah. know anything about it. I don't know if it did particularly well. It was sort of one of those like angry movies that came out of like just frustration and whatever. But but yeah, it was it was that time I was a senior in high school. All that all this links up. This is all one moment. But the but home is prefaced right there, obviously, because this section is this section that we're gonna talk about is all about home and having a home and being home. And it's like she's left behind. So we ended the last section with the widow and the widow's being sort of a stand-in as like an older version of the writer of the narrator giving advice to the narrator about how to be as a writer and how to be in the world and how to deal with the fact that you can't just say what you want to say you have to you have to be able to be a fox and and sort of work your way through that especially as a woman and now we turn away from that into like this wanting to address the problems that she has we're on like page 116 right away it's saying like you know uh talking telling the story about this writer that she knew who who wanted to deal with her problem of muskrats and dissected a muskrat for a book that she was writing and faced her fears, faced her problem. And the narrator asking like, when will I face my problem? And then suddenly you go into a lot of stuff about cities and about a home and having a home. And that becomes a the clear kind of focus of the first half of this, this particular section. But I do have to say, have you, have muskrats, the second that that came up, I grew up in a remote t part of uh, Michigan where there are ditches everywhere. And we would create like these floating styrofoam boats to go down the ditches um, because we were lame and had nothing else to do. And muskrats would always come and try and attack us. Those things are fast. <laughs> like you'd have to them off with your oar because they just come at you and just be like, come in and just eat your styrofoam and sink your ship. They, they fuck those things. They fuck muskrats. I, when I read like this dissection, this the first time I was like, yes, dissect the ball. 
Kill their babies. <laughs> Don't care. They're not a real animal. <laughs> did you ever? Did you ever eat a muskrat? They talk about no. people in Belgium eating them. Apparently, I well, I that, but I think you know, yeah. They that makes it sound like because it's Belgium, it sounds like it's probably a delicacy with frites and mussels on the side. But like where I grew up, if you ate a muskrat, that was just roadkill, and like you yeah. were. That's like were, eating a squirrel. You know, your your, yeah. your country. Yeah. No, that's so good. That's like that's like a one way ticket to to the bad part of the trailer park. <laughs> The only thing I know about muskrats is uh, Captain and Tennille, you know, that's all I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm curious though, George, what, what made you excited about the, this section that you wanted to be on for this? Oh, you section? know, the, the, the part that, it, that got me was um, the, sec, the, the little, it's, it's not even a page long, it's, it's um, her in Calcutta. And that's, there we go. That, that was the part. And it just, um, there are just like a few descriptions in there that just, I was in Calcutta like four years ago, I think. And it was, uh, it was amazing. It's amazing how, how she nailed it. It's, it's really, it's really, that was, that was the reason that, that, that I like this section a lot. I was curious of you, because I knew that you had been there for the, there's part of the Seagull School, publishing school, right. correct? Yeah. yeah. And I wondered if this was, if this kind of got a hold of that. Of what the city was like, I I love that description. It seems so chaotic and overwhelming, and like just so many things it, all at once. It was um, unfortunately part of part of that description that she does. She's she basically said it's it's like she's lumping everybody together into this. Like everybody's living on the street. Everybody's like. Uh, Everybody's like tropical, you know, the homeless are acting like tropical slugs and stuff. It's right. page 118, I think. Yep. But um, when I landed and I had just flown into India, we had gone through uh, Delhi and we just landed in Calcutta. And if you looked on the um, traveler on the weather app, it just said, you know, usually it's like cloudy, you know, rainy. You know, it said it just said smoke, and uh, when, <laughs> when we landed, it was it was just smoke. It wasn't even haze. It was smoke, and um, there was some kind of political thing going on where there was like a rally for like a a candidate, or I can't remember what exactly they they, they had a name for it. The, the this person, but um, they had bust people in from outside of Calcutta. And they there were like these just like really elaborately painted buses and just full of people. And apparently they pay them the people they paid the people to come in. And we just hit this like we land, it's dark, it's smoky. And all of a sudden we're in this huge traffic backup, like, you know, with all these buses going like two miles an hour. Oh, when we finally got into Calcutta, it was like, um, we checked into this guest house and I went into, uh, I went into my room and picked up the, uh, I looked at the sheet and picked up the sheet and it had like all these little tiny holes in it. I went, Okay, we're not staying here. <laughs> we're out of here. <laughs> and uh, so and I had gone with Rick Simonson from Ellington Bay, and I just texted him. And and you know, I I, I hardly ever texted at that time. I just said texted. Just said, we're we're out of here. We're gone. We're out of this one. But um, it was, you know, the people were amazing. Um, you know, they're just um, the poverty is amazing. You know, they were, it was kind of cold at night, so people were, you know, I think the smoke was because people were creating fires in the street. And, you know, unfortunately, they were burning stuff like plastic bottles and shit. So it was like, it, it was it was insane. So it, it does have that chaos. She just nailed the chaos of the place. Hmm. That's the part I like. <laughs> the, the part that my favorite line in there, and 118 is towards the bottom, it, uh, it says, on the street, people rolled up their rags, their sheets, their coverlets, and draped them over the fences that ran along the road. The people seemed to do little else than air their mouse holes, wash, trim hair, shave, copulate, give birth, die, pray to their gods, defecate, prepare food, raise children, feed their livestock, 
and all of this on the street, which right up into that, and all of this oh on the God. street. It's like, well, that's everything you can do. <laughs> it's like, that's, like, that's like everything. And then, but then the on the street adds that little bit of a like, oh yeah, okay. Oh, I see. Yeah, there's, it was like, you know, there, there were people, there were people on the street, like cutting hair and shaving and uh, shaving other people. Like there were barbers, like on the street. It's, it's a pretty amazing place. It really is amazing. You know, and then in the middle of all that, sort of in the middle of all the kind of kind of chaos, there's, you know, you go into the Siegel offices and it's like you're in a gallery, you know, it's just it's like all this art on the wall and it's just it's amazing. It's amazing. But all the people I met there are just like phenomenal. But the food was insane. But it is kind of chaotic. And when you drive into town and you drive out of town, there are, they're like pylons with like rebar sticking out of it. You have no idea. You don't know, you don't know if this is, if they're actually building something or if they tore something down. Um, I don't like across, rebar. across from the school, there were these guys and they were carrying up like bags of, con of cement, of concrete. And uh, they did it the whole time we were there and they were just like walking up the scaffolding. It was, yeah, pretty amazing. Pretty amazing. And I'm not big on chaos. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, th and that's what I mean. That's what's great about this book. This uh, the sequencing of this part too, because we have like the immigration or, or movement theme has shown up in each of the first two sections with like the Russian writer talking about Japan and like the movement of Russian Russian um, immigrants towards the east instead of towards the west which is what you usually think about and then she brings up emigration in the second section where she's at the conference to talk about that and then here you have a situation in which she has emigrated the character the narrator has left mm -hmm. um Croatia and left her home her home country for reasons that get very like direct and aggressive in in the later part of this um and is left with no city and like that feeling then becomes much more personal. So it's not literary anymore. It's not scholarly. It's very much like she sees that her life is basically reflected in these cities and in these maps of these cities or what these cities look like. And Calcutta being one of them of like the chaos, if that's where she is, like that's that's such a breakdown. And then goes on to tell this story about being in, in New York as well. And like all the different things about, um, about uh, like, having the bare essentials and the having a, a place that's home and being able to say that there's a place that's home um, and that, that she finally decides that when she gets back to Amsterdam, she's going to get a place that's not an apartment but have her her specific space. And then the, everything gets kind of flipped with this almost fairy tale like quality where suddenly she inherits a, a house, um, which I want to talk about in a second. But I want to do I want to do a very this is this is special to anyone watching the YouTube. You get a special uh, a special visual gag, but if on page one twenty two, there's the bit at the bottom where there's the, that new section that starts with our deepest desires pounce on us from unexpected places, ambush us, snatch us by the throat, and steal our breath. I was in New York one July after spending two semesters in a small American college town on my way to Europe, but not going home because I no longer had a home. And that she's done a few times in her life, but just today um, we got an special like on. Unpackaging thing. I know on YouTube everyone's always unboxing stuff or unwrapping <laughs> things. So I figure to, to tie into that trend, I can unwrap for you guys the brand new Dubrovsky Greshik book, American Fictionary, which is a series right. of essays about living in exile in America, teaching in Middleton, Connecticut. Um, during the Yugoslav War and writing about the differences between what's going on with things here in America versus and what people are obsessed with and concerned about, like jogging and donuts, versus like what's happening in <laughs> Croatia at that point in time. So, yeah. special this unpacking, even... American Fictionary. It is here. It is going out to reviewers and bookstores tomorrow. So, so oh, is that is that your advance? Advance. This is our finished version, finished copies. Is, is it your around. first? Is it the fruit? Is it an advance? Advance. Yeah, sort of. Well, yeah, they, they, yeah, yeah. So first one. So you all get to see it here. Who's watching? And if you're listening to this, you should watch the video and subscribe because then you get to see fun little things like that. <laughs> so wait, so that was a that's a collection of essays, correct? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, because I thought this was really fascinating. This this part starts off very essay like with the history of the muskrat and the you know all the the. Um, the facts and figures about how it works in the world. And then we get to that part two, and it turns into more fiction and more narrative. It's a really interesting shift. 
uh, yeah, it was it was more prominent here than it was in previous sections. I noticed. I had thought about this as I was riding uh, the bike home or to go pick up my daughter, and um, there's like so I finally watched that. There's a Hannah Gadsby's Nanette, the the comedy special that's on Netflix that a lot of people have been talking about because um, it's this from this uh, Australian she's from uh, Tasmania, I guess. Um, comic who quits being a comic in the middle and she basically goes on a rant about how misogynistic and problematic comedy is where it's getting you to laugh at people who are already disenfranchised and painful and like she's using her own experiences as a lesbian for comedy purposes to relieve people of their tension and that that's dangerous it sort of like elides then the comedic the way that comedy is supposed to work and gets into something different and it occurred to me that in the in a lot of Dubrovka's writing she sort of does that with the novel like there's an expectation of fiction or of a novel yeah. to work in a certain way and that way is going to build into what she says on page whatever it is where people read with a dyslexia where men can write like the notes from underground and be angry and be falling down and have those rants and have that bit and women can only write romances and that there's no way around that sort of circumstance because then you're just labeled as a mad woman and so she gets rid of the fictional the normal novelistic qualities the expectation of things to rise and fall of this consistent character arc of these developing things to include what she needs to include to get to a larger truth that uh, that's only allowed in the novel by breaking apart what the novel can be in a lot of for a lot of people I think that's what makes this really fascinating too. Yeah, there there tends to be like this sort of like twisting and writhing between like an like an, an uh, a familiar essay form and then back into a novelistic form. It's really fascinating. I really really enjoy it quite a bit. And that's what when she gets the house. I always thought that I thought this the first time, and I really thought it this time that all of a sudden it starts to take on. She writes a lot about fairy tales or about the structure of fairy tales, and this has that sort of almost fairy tale like quality. Like you yes. get a letter out of the blue that some some random benefactor has given you a a uh, house, and it's like it's like a Dickens thing where she says it's sure. all about money. Like all of a sudden, like the money fall, finds the right person. She needs a home. Suddenly, she has a home. And, and there's like, a charming man boys. that lives in the attic, but he's gonna yeah. care. He's gonna tend to the garden, and then you know, like yeah, 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 yeah. It's got that. He's been taking care of stuff. There's a cat that takes care of the mice. <laughs> it's like very fairy tale ass. Yeah. Then there's like the really nice, and it's not entirely subtle per se, but um, the bit about where it references where he says like, oh, I'm going to take you out to the, so she, to so anyone who, who is, who hasn't read this or needs a refresher, she, um, the narrator inherits this house. It's out in the countryside, not that far from Zagreb. So she drives out there. Um, so this beautiful little house that's all taken care of out in the middle of a farmland or in, in the middle of a forest. And um, she goes inside and finds that there's been a guy that's been there, you know, tending to it well, since the, the owner had passed away and the owner had been a fan of hers. So he decided to leave her his house because he didn't have anyone else to leave it to. Um, and the part that's sort of, uh, uh, that, that's sort of like a series of literary like little bits is when um, towards the end of the section we're talking about at 140, um, she mentions the orchard and he's like, oh, I'll show you the orchard, shows her the orchard. And then, which immediately brings to mind Chekhov. Chekhov's then referenced, was it Chekhov? Did I know? True, the orchard wasn't whatever, but so Chekhov gets mentioned. And then the next section is all about how the guy that's living there is a deminer because there are so many landmines that were left through, strewn throughout Croatia that they hired people to help find these mines and, and get rid of them so that it would be safer because there's at least 60,000 mines left behind from the Yugoslav war. And so you've got, you've got Orchard Chekhov and the mines, which is sort of a nice foreshadowing or bringing up that whole Chekhov's gun scenario. But in this case, the gun is a landmine. Do you know what uh, the World War II reference is with the Devil's Garden? Do not. Oh, this this will show you how tricksy she actually is. I don't know why I know this. I I was fascinated with uh, General Rommel. He was a, a Nazi general. Uh, I think had a Panzer division in North Africa, uh, and apparently he was the one that was supposed to be defending D Day, but was like sick or with his wife on the D Day invasion, so he wasn't there to stop the Allies. But uh, he had a defense line called the Devil's Garden. Um, in North Africa, and it was there was like barbed wire and like millions of landmines. Oh, it, was called, wow. it was called the Devil's Garden. And then um, his nickname after what he did in uh, North Africa was the Desert Fox. So Rommel was had a nickname as wow. the Fox, and he had a Devil's Garden of landmines. 
in World War II, which he does reference World War II in here with the dates matching the the Kosovo Wars. So like, yeah, this lady is insane with the way she buries <laughs> references and trickiness and like whole like she went like nine deep on us there. And I, <laughs> that's amazing. I'm trying to see. I don't think that's a reference in here, but that's incredible. Here's to you, Dubrovka. That is. I assume, I assume that's what it is because it matches up perfect. Yeah. I mean, it has to be purposeful. And oh my gosh, dude, she's good. She's really good. <laughs> yep. Absolutely. There's, yeah, mm -hmm. there's, I'm not And I don't know if it mentions it later in the, uh, but it was the this first thing I thought of. It was the first thing I thought of when I thought of Devil's Garden. I'm like, oh, that, is that Rommel, the desert fox, I wonder? Or, and then the landmines come up and I'm like, oh, okay, maybe it is. That's wild. And there also is like the reference to her father having the, the war injury that seems to be like a, the shrap a shrapnel, piece of shrapnel. Right? Yeah, inside. which you would get yep. from a mine. Yeah. Yep. Uh, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. She's no, she is no joke. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's yeah. really, you can't not pay attention. If you miss something, and also the wordplay of like where she goes to the house and she starts referring to it as mine, as my house, my things, my invader that comes in, all the things, and mine and mine are also a nice little like mm -hmm. linkage there, <laughs> which just is funny. Plus, and it, Rommel, Rommel was the bad guy in the TV series Rat Patrol, and rats are related to muskrats. <laughs> this is true. It all ties all of them. <laughs> and also, and also the, the dormice uh, upstairs in the attic. Yeah. Exactly. It's all. It really is. You can't. You can't not. Well, no, because because there's also the connection of, of switching from partisan to homeland, right? Yes. Yeah. And then the idea of home, like yep. going home and having a home. And yeah. the the homeland, yeah, and home being a kind of fraught situation there. Like you fought yeah. for your homeland, which is not not necessarily the best thing for Yugoslavia and for most people that section where she goes on the bit about the rant about like not having a home and leaving her forsaking her home um is intense like and that yeah. does speak to the experiences i know of it that she that dubovka really had um and that Helen, uh, ellen talked about last week a little bit um but it's it's very it's very hard to read and like you know that like she went through some of these things so like having left left home um and didn't her then not i mean it just goes on and on and on a series of questions but like did my friends write me off watching silently as the powers that be batted me about they the cat i the mouse showing an indifference that ice my blood in their veins did they ever wonder where i was going would i be back did i need any help look after all the years we'd spent as friends weren't they interested in these trifles so what about later did they ever seek me out isn't 20 years long enough to think at least once of one's lost friends like that's really harsh and like I mean, keeps, all the stuff about like the publishers catalogs everyone that like is there that that just ignored her is and the fact that like they didn't even criticize her books or damn her for being like having left croatia they just ignored her which is way way worse um more more painful to deal with and then to go back to that home where you've now inherited at home has like a lot of like emotional baggage along with it <laughs> Just really, really, really good. You know, I, I, I read slowly, which of course is a big liability for being on the best translated book award jury. Fact. But you know, I, you know, it takes me like I, I'd be, I'd be nice if I was reading a book a week or so. But um, I, I, of the books that I've read this year, you know, I've read some really like uh, some of the big books this year. This by far is the smartest book that I've read. I mean, it, it's it's amazing. And I, and I think it'll end up being the smartest book that I read because of all that interplay, of all, you know, of like every, every page, there's something you go, whoa. And you don't know if it's all true, but, you know. It's a novel. It doesn't have to be. It's a novel. True. Yeah. It, has to, it has to be art. <laughs> and I think it does, and it's building. And, like, we've got more sections that will keep – kind of coming back to these themes and doing more with them. But this one is, uh, this part so far in here is really incredible. There's one section that we did have, we talked about this in my class, um, which I bring up a lot on here, but it was one that is, is a bit complicated. And I, I kind of wish we had asked um, Ellen about it before. Maybe we'll ask her or Dubravka later, but on 136 and 137, there's a bit about um, 
where the kids, the local kids are sort of like intimidating her by calling her auntie. And it says the children were yeah. in the world mama from American urban slang into auntie in Croatian. And was and that was likely enough how they dressed all women who didn't fit the category of grandma. So it's like clear, like you get what's going on. It's one of these interesting translation problems of like, how do you translate things from English into another language to have a meaning in that language? But it's all implied, like it all makes sense. Like auntie's sort of a dismissive like, like way of, of referring to a nondescript uh, um, like woman who's not a grandmother and not then is above a certain age. Yeah, um, but then it has the interesting part of like, I wondered what kids use as a retort these days. In my time, it would have been change the record or switch the channel. What would the, the analog be now? Reboot? Um, which is interesting because I don't, that's one part where I like, I don't know what that connects to exactly. Like, I don't think I've ever heard that sort of retort and I, I can't think of what I would have, what would be analogous exactly. Well, so in the nineties, you'd say, re I, I got to reboot the computer, but people don't say reboot anymore. But I remember saying that. Like, <laughs> yeah, I don't remember like ever a, saying like, use the record or like a 380, uh, you know, an IBM 386, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm constantly rebooting my computer. <laughs> Restarting, but I think that's an interesting, like, tricky translation. Yeah, that section. one stuck out to me too. I didn't, I didn't catch it. What it meant, or I mean, the whole thing—it makes sense, but I don't yeah. know what it's what there's. I feel like there's still something more there that if you ask Dubravka or Ellen to unpack, like what that that kind of train of of associations and of like semantics of those words are. I bet it's really interesting, but I'm not sure that I know what it is reading it here the second time. Just swipe right. Swipe right. Swipe right. Yeah, that's the new one. That's it. That would be it. <laughs> Swipe right or left or whatever. I don't know which one's which, but swipe one of the ways. Yeah. <laughs> I always hear this and I can never keep it straight. I have no idea. I think it's swipe right because that's like pass, pass, pass. <laughs> or is, is that right? I don't You're know. swiping towards the left. Okay, swipe left. Who knows? <laughs> so I never know. read The Little Prince and I missed the irony on 139 when he says that he's raising a fox or he's trying to trying to tame a fox. Yep. And and then she says the fox from Little Prince, she says with irony, but I've never read Little Prince, so I don't know what it is. You got you've got kids. You've got, you had to read the Little Prince, right? Yeah. Nope. I've never read it. <laughs> I, I openly admit that I am in the same boat that it's one of those things that I own copies of. And or maybe I have when I was a long time ago. I remember nothing about it. I know that it's incredibly famous. I know that people, it's translated a billion times. People love it. I don't remember any part of it. You, Brian, you got, you got a kid that's perfect for this. Yeah, uh, I just read her Three Little Bears. And I was trying to figure out <laughs> what the moral of that story is. <laughs> so she wakes up, she gets scared by the bears and leaves. It's just like, bye. It's a, weird, it's a weird story. No, I have not read The Little Prince. Um, how, how none of us that this feels like you know not not right <laughs> the only fox one i read was uh todd and copper remember that one with the hound dog and the was it a raccoon or no uh, i don't remember that one was okay, like here we a, go. one was a coon hound and one was a dog and they couldn't be friends because they're supposed to hate each other so in the in the Wikipedia entry, which is the best we're going to get unless someone listening to this live wants to fill us in, um, the prince uh, encounters a bunch of rose bushes. Um, thought it was his own rose. Uh, he gets downcast because like the thing that the rose that he had was unique, and that's not true. Um, he begins to feel that he was not a great prince at all, as his planet contained only three tiny volcanoes and a flower that he now thought of as common. He lay down on the grass and wept until a fox came along. The fox desires to be tamed and teaches the prince how to tame him. By being tamed, something goes from being ordinary and just like all the others to being special and unique. There are drawbacks since the connection can lead to sadness and longing when apart. From the fox, the prince learns that his rose was indeed unique and special because she was the object of the prince's love and time. He had tamed her and now she was more precious than all the roses he had seen in the garden. Upon their sad departing, the fox imparts a secret. Important things can only be seen with the heart, not with the eyes. There you go. There you go. Yeah, I'm good. Thanks. <laughs> I'm good. I won't have to read it now. <laughs> <laughs> I brought it up. And that this Wikipedia entry is like 400 pages long. 
Right. There's there's section after section after section. I thought this book was was much shorter than that, but well, there you go. I admittedly now everyone this is sort fraud. of bad. It's bad because I've got a copy of the Little Prince downstairs, and it's, I think um, I... and it was um, Raj Schwartz translated yep. it. And yep. She gave me a copy of it when I was in yep. Calcutta, and yeah, I... um and I brought it back on the plane with me, and I've never read it. Never. She read gave it. she gave me a copy as a gift as well. I had the same book. Oh, yeah. She must have bought. She must have got like you know a zillion you know comps out of that baby. Maybe, you know, maybe she, she, maybe she doesn't even get paid for it. You know. <laughs> Hopefully she's just not listening. <laughs> but anyways, well, I don't know if I have anything else to add to the section. I think this is a great setup for this and works really well um, for getting to the next part, which we're going to go over uh, next time. But yeah, um, it ends with a nice little you know. Cliffhanger is not the right word, but there's like a portent of like, there's the whole mouse thing through it. And then there's the mouse trap of the moon being like cheese, but also looking like a landmine. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so it just kind of hangs on that image of like a trap and a landmine and she's living in a, in a town full of man of mines. So I'm, I'm just wondering, like, all right, something's got to go off, right? Stars <laughs> and landmines, man. Stars yeah. and landmines. So I'm, yeah. I'm very curious to see, because obviously she doesn't set anything up without having some some purpose for it. So I'm very excited to see what she's doing with this. So. Yep. So it's do you have a favorite? A weird place, it's kind of a weird place to break, though, you know, yeah. as far as the, the pod, because the next section, uh, it's kind of yeah. brutal. Yeah. It's, this is like, you know, it's like a lead into the next section. It's almost it's, it's uh, almost the perfect a little way. little intense, you know. <laughs> it's it's kind of perfect though to stop right there. You got they got the momentum building. It's setting up. We went. We got a lot of the themes sort of unpacked in here, and then, boom. <laughs> <laughs> I count goes the dynamite. I suppose. <laughs> oh man! So do you guys have a favorite favorite line from here? Uh, I've been enjoying. Uh, her concrete details that she uses when describing things or people. Um, and I just, I find her really, really funny. Like, like first and foremost, she's, she has just got this acerbic wit about her that I just love. And uh, like one brief example on page 120, um, on the way back from Amsterdam to Amsterdam from London, she sees these people, these loud people on a, on a tram or whatever. And, uh, these men resemble the TV ad aimed at beer drinkers. <laughs> I just, it's such a simple, clean line, but oh man, it just made me chuckle and laugh. She's, she's so funny and so spot on with her descriptions of things. And I just keep being delighted uh, over and over again with these uh, descriptions of people. So I'll, I'll choose a funny one. <laughs> That's a great section. I love that part too, because it's like, all the way back from Amsterdam to Amsterdam from London, I was pressing at an imaginary remote control, yearning to turn down the volume. <laughs> turn down the volume. Right. The world is too loud. And she's it's like sweating. So the, the character is sweating, and there's somebody with like a tattoo looking at them, and they're sweating <laughs> against the man's face. The it was such a great. Oh yeah, I just felt claustrophobic. That feels very much like Calcutta. It's, fun, it's funny because that that was a section that I really really liked. I was going to bring that up, and so. <laughs> Just, it's like so close to an, like a panic attack. It's so close to it, you know, yeah. my, my airplane anxieties that, you know, it's yeah. like, oh man, I, I get it. This is sort of taking it in a different direction, but in the middle of camping, in the middle of a KOA in the woods, you know, it's usually pretty silent. It's like the first time you get away from, and you're out camping where everything at like 11 o'clock is just silent. And it's and it's nice. It's very cool for that to happen. But um, in the middle of one of the nights when we were out there, all of a sudden I woke up because I heard someone just screaming, and this guy was just screaming, "You motherfuckers! Fuck you, motherfuckers!" And there had been some sort of confrontation. And to tie this all together, the guy went storming off because I could see sort of out the out of my tent window. He went storming off and yelling at people, and someone was yelling at him to go take a walk. And this is in Ontario. You can't act like that here, blah, blah, blah. And I thought, this guy's going to go get a motherfucking gun and come back and just annihilate 
all of us. Like this, this is an Ontario. <laughs> this is an Ontario was the greatest line I've ever heard. But I was literally like, it was like the falling down moment of like, this guy's gonna lose his shit and there's nothing, I'm in a tent that is fabric. Like this is how it ends, <laughs> this is no good. Which is a which is a random off take of that. But do you have a favorite line, George? <laughs> You know, it's it's like that whole Calcutta Col section. I can't really find the line in particular that I really like out of there. It's all, okay. you know, the one that you read about, you know, on the street, people rolled out their rags, blah, blah, blah. That's probably the strongest of the of the lines in that section, but yeah. I really like that. And the one, Kolkata has the feel of a well-lived chaos, though this chaos could have been a synonym for frenetic organization. That's That was my other one that I really liked. The one that I was going to choose ties into yours, Brian. Too often the words and sentences said by people I was talking to and strangers on the street or on a tram sounded weird. <laughs> I love, it's like when someone says happy as the day is long, she's like, it's just, it's just all of a sudden that doesn't make sense. Like it just sort of is a weird phrase. <laughs> sounds I do odd. like the, 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 the part that, don't, that ends the section where she says, where it says, I don't remember when I last saw stars, I said, the stars are all we have, he laughed, stars and landmines, I added. It's just, it really sets up the next section. I mean, Absolutely. Yeah. This is perfect. So, so yeah, so next week we'll be going over the last part of this, which goes from 144 to 183, I believe. Um, yep, 183, and tie that all together. And if things go right, we'll, we'll, we'll have a guest out. Well, I'll double check and make sure everyone's on before announcing it, but we've got a bunch of people lined up. Um, there's also, for anyone listening who didn't see it, there's a really good review of this book in Asymptote, um, the online magazine. And the person who wrote it is planning to come on the podcast towards the end to be able to talk about the book as a whole. But the review, if you finish the book, read the review, because it's one of the most intelligent, like comprehensive reviews of a book that I've read in eons. Um, and if you haven't finished it, you wow might not want to do it, but you might still get something out of it because he really grounds a lot of the different themes and ideas and engages with the book on an intellectual level that is, you know, not that common um, in the world today. I mean, there's a lot of good reviewers, but this is like a very, very long review, very detailed, very intelligent. And I think you'd like it. And to tie this all back together in a sort of Ugrushic way, um, he also <laughs> used to be the historian for Tottenham Hotspur. Tottenham Hotspur. Hey. <laughs> And we do have one comment from the from the YouTube group, which is um, that Tom Flynn, former guest, several time former guest, says that who's part of our football league says that he is uh, his anti you now, George. He 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 doesn't he wishes he hadn't tried to bump up people watching on on Twitter because he's a Liverpool fan. So Ooh. you guys are now mortal enemies. Okay, I like Liverpool. I just don't <laughs> like them when they play like Tottenham. So. <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. So, um, if you want to find, yeah, us but he was he was he was dissing the surprise guest tonight on Twitter. No, oh, I know. Yeah. He, he was basically saying, if if it's not me, it can't be good. So, okay, <laughs> we're, you know, I'm gonna, uh, you know what? During the draft, I'm gonna draft nothing but Liverpool players. I'm just gonna <laughs> draft. My team's gonna be all Liverpool, and they're gonna make him buy them from me. An accelerated be price. That would be spectacular. <laughs> so, anyways, you can find all the information about um, the two month review on our website at 3%, which is rochester.edu forward slash 3%, or by following us on Twitter um, at open letter, open underscore letter. Um, I'm Chad W. Post on all those things, although I'm barely using them anymore. Um, Brian is Brian Wood underscore. And George, are you on Twitter anymore? Or did you, you got off? Yeah, I'm on. Phrasing, okay. phrasing. Yeah, barely. I've got like, you know, three followers and I follow like six people. Solid. Well, what, what do you want more? INTL literature, Intel literature. Perfect. That's it. There you go. So you can but, follow everyone. But you can follow me, but and then, then you'd be like the fourth person to follow me. <laughs> or fifth. I'm gonna Maybe get Tom on. Flynn will follow me now that he knows that um, you know. I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna follow you right now as soon as I okay. as soon as I find it. my phone charges. I'm on it. <laughs> so, so thanks again, guys. Thanks for coming All on, right. George. And we'll thanks. we'll be back next week with uh, the next section of Fox. Awesome. Bye, guys. Good night.